Hey, I'm Hollis, and welcome to the Friendly Fangirl Podcast, where I nerd out on the films, shows, and video games that I encounter every week. Be sure to follow this podcast, and please follow my Twitter and blog at Hollis Films to follow my journey experiencing the entertainment industry's greatest stories. Beware of spoilers, you have been warned. Uncharted Drake's Fortune There is a real serious nostalgia when playing this game. It all lies in our big three, Nathan Drake, Sully, and Elena, played by the amazing Nolan North, Richard McGonagall, and Emily Rose. Nate is... basically Nathan Fillion, and I hope that's enough to characterize him. Just go watch Firefly or Nathan's Uncharted fam film. (laughs) Sully goddamn Sullivan. He's everyone's favorite uncle, and Elena represents all the strong women. She's an absolute Gryffindor and is up for a challenge or a dangerous adventure. (laughs) She's a real homie. (laughs) The only thing better than the characters is how they interact with each other, and that totally goes back to the chemistry Nolan, Richard, and Emily had in their scenes. I've watched every single episode of Retro Replay, now Couch Soup, as they played through the series, and I absorbed all the behind the scenes information, and it's just the coolest what they accomplished here and learning how it was done. Go look up Nolan playing his own game series. You won't regret it. Gameplay wise, it's easy to say this one hasn't aged well. The word janky or clunky or awkward could be used for Drake's fortune, especially seeing how the preceding Uncharted games, as well as The Last of Us, provide much smoother experiences. But Drake's fortune provided a good enough foundation to make literally all aspects satisfyingly improved on throughout the series. While I do prefer how the combat and inventory works in The Last of Us, The limited resources seen in Uncharted forces you to strategize, to pick and choose which two guns you need for a situation. It is really great that instead of health, you quite literally start blacking out and all you have to do is circle to cover to take a breath before going back into the fray. Stealth doesn't really seem to be a thing in this game, in fact I only remember it being used or useful in the third, so you have to get good at the shooter aspect really fast. What Uncharted is really about is the Indiana Jones vibes, exploring the world, finding treasures, and solving puzzles. The puzzles in Drake's Fortune are pretty simple. I know they get more complex through 2 and 3, but it's still a really great start and really makes the treasure hunter theme alive. One of my favorite parts of the game. Also, climbing. (laughs) Definitely gets better in the future, like so many other things, but it's good enough here. Yes, Strike's Fortune has aged as many games from this era have done, but the music, the level design, the characters, the adventure, the legacy of Nathan Drake started here, and it just makes me really excited to play the sequel. (laughs) Okay, grab your popcorn. Lost Season 6. There are several things I would like to say. (laughs) So, I've heard around that Lost gets bad towards the end, or at least has a dissatisfying ending. Gonna jump way ahead. Honestly... I expected it to be bad, and it wasn't as bad as I prepared for it to be. First of all, it all started and ended with Jack, and I say this because the beginning of the pilot and the ending of the series finale were pretty much his per- her, his perspective. Everyone else who survived, I guess it's not hard to guess. Hugo is the new Jacob, Ben I guess gets his job back, Desmond goes back to his family, The Ajira 6 go back to real life. I guess I'm assuming the life Kate had with Aaron begins anew with Claire and Sawyer. This is like Destiel, guys. (laughs) 
Who's to say Destiel doesn't go gay in heaven for eternity? Mm Mm-hmm. So who's to tell me Kate and Sawyer don't settle down together? Between that and Desmond surviving, I'm pretty happy, but still sour about Juliet, but whatever. And the Quans, (laughs) that was unfair. (laughs) Another thing I think could put people off is that the Flashes to an islandless world, I think, is easily interpreted as an alternate dimension, as I'll reference it to it as such, but it's technically the afterlife. An Earth without the island is quite literally heaven. (laughs) Desmond's quest didn't really have any real-world substance, though. Saeed and the Quans, what did they die for? For an afterlife? In the end, that is really poetic, it was emotional, but then I realized I was still unsure what the point was, and it boils down to the smoke monster. (laughs) That thing was introduced in the very first episode of the entire dang series, and it was the final boss in the series finale. We got the origin story, and we still know little about it. So every sacrifice the island demanded, every horrible thing that has happened, it was all so Desmond could put out the light to take away the monster's immortality, give a chance for someone to kill it, and put the light back on to potentially keep the world together or something. I know there are other pockets of energy similar to what is seen on the island, so I'm assuming all the lights go out and the world implodes? But I never really understood what exactly the monster was capable of. Why was it so imperative that he had to stay on the island or be killed? And because I don't understand this, I don't understand why my favorite characters had to die. Why John Locke? Why did he have to die? I'm a little upset. (laughs) There's still so much about the island we don't understand either. There's an essence, like, the island is itself a character. It's alive. Locke has talked about it in such a way in the past, and what is with the Egyptian hieroglyphs and structures? Like, what is the story there? It's more than just the brothers. The island's mysteries will haunt me for my entire life. (laughs) Alright, let's start from the beginning. Jack, crazy son of a... he did it. (laughs) Kind of. That premiere confused the hell out of me, but what else is new? The explosion put our people back in their correct timeline, but we're still getting an alternate timeline where Jack's plan worked, but there are still signs that it's not just an alternate timeline, but that they jumped into this timeline, hence the blood and Jaja Vu. Other Jack seems to have some sort of nagging thought way down deep, and Desmond... Yeah, it all comes full circle, but you have to wait until literally the last 10 minutes of the series to really understand what is going on. (laughs) Also, the Quans. It took them way too long to reunite. I almost thought it would never happen. So when I tell you I didn't expect the moment when it came, I was sobbing. I I mean it. (laughs) Oh, also, also... John has been the smoke monster this entire time. My first thought was wondering if we're finally going to learn something about it after five seasons. On the monster's quest to complete his goal, he went on a little adventure to some cave on a cliff and we see the names of some of our people with numbers next to their names. Those are the numbers, guys. The numbers that he, that gave Hugo a stroke. 4, 8, 14, 15, 23, 42, OMG. Saeed died and came back to life in the temple. People believed he was claimed by the darkness, like Claire. Like, they're sick. And I feel like we're finally getting more answers to what Russo meant way back in season one when she first talked about her people and what happened to them. Saeed is now evil. I think that's another thing that was never really clear, and we'll never know how Claire fared afterwards. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, Jacob, Richard, and the Smoke Monster. (laughs) The three icons of the island. I have wanted their history basically the entire 
series, and we finally saw Richard's origin story. Though, going from Bates Motel to this, I did not need to see Nestor Carbonell cry over his dead wife again. I did not have the tolerance for that PTSD trigger. <laughs> Unnecessary. <laughs> However, remember when Desmond would flash between moments in time? Well, now he can flash between alternate dimension heaven the same way. <laughs> I don't know if it was Widmore's new machine or other Charlie giving him deja vu, but Desmond knows. And so does Eloise and I guess Faraday and Charlie seem like he knew for a bit. So it's not just Jack that was feeling this heavenly pull throughout the season. Speaking of, they, they brought Desmond back. They couldn't let Juliet reunite with her sister, and now they gotta drag Desmond back to the blasted island for what? For what? I know it works out in the end, but I was anxious watching his scenes for the entirety of the season. I mean, remember the submarine incident? <sighs> Rip Saeed, son, Jen. I swear to God, if Desmond died. <laughs> Shout out to Lapidus. My homie just along for the ride, surviving like a pro. <laughs> Tale of Two Brothers I'm not sure if it was confirmed before or just simply hinted at for the longest time, but Jacob's brother has been the smoke monster this entire time. We finally got an origin story to the monster as well, but so much is still confusing. After seeing this thing since the dang pilot, not even an origin story was enough to satisfy your curiosity. As soon as I realized the two bodies were in the cave, in the cave were the smoke monster and kidnapper mom, they began playing the scene from season one when their skeletons were discovered. Everything came full circle, and there's still so much we don't know after this. Alright, taking it back to the series finale. There's a lot of fan service here. A lot of fan service. <laughs> and despite the confusing lead up, I'm here for it. <laughs> Another shout out to Lapidus. He's thriving. Miles. I don't believe in a lot of things, but I do believe in duct tape. Juliet's place in heaven is the utmost unusual thing about this season. She's Jack's heaven baby mama. What is the significance? Why does David exist? Everyone else was from the island. Who the hell was David? <laughs> I just... <laughs> he was... He was literally... Invent He's like the prime example of a red herring, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> John remembering made me think two things. Um, one, there's 45 minutes left of the series and I still don't understand what's going on. And two... John died in that stupid hotel room. He died off the island. The land he sacrificed everything for. The land that he loved more than anything. The place that gave him paradise. And that left a feeling of betrayal. His story was tragic. And the island couldn't even give him the chance to be happy. Speaking of tragedy, Sun and Jin. There was no greater heartbreak. <laughs> Seeing their montage broke me and I didn't even have time to recover because the Claire and Charlie and Aaron reunion. <laughs> Look, I get the reputation for the finale being bad, but when it comes to the end of various character arcs, the only disappointing ones were of those who died, Saeed specifically. <laughs> Overall, it's not the finale that's disappointing, more so the missing lore that I've been mentioning throughout this segment and the purpose of this alternate dimension heaven and the events taking place here. The finale is great, it's just the season itself as a whole that deserves a criticism. But with the finale, they got pretty much the entire cast, every character from every season. 
They all had their moments, and it was such a celebration of these characters and stories by forcing us into these fragile emotional states as we see their lives flash before our eyes, being reminded of all that they went through, all that they went through, feeling happy and sad for them all at the same time. It was bittersweet. That, that was good writing. <laughs> Phenomenal and probably authentic acting. But I understand if it doesn't sit com comfortably with you, but fan service, <laughs> like I said, I was here for it. And at the end of the day, despite how it ended, Lost is a really good show, and I'm really glad that I watched it. Please check out my blog uh, and reread my thoughts through all the seasons. It's been quite the journey, and if you haven't seen Lost, hopefully you weren't paying attention because I threw a lot of spoilers, but I definitely recommend anyone to watch it or rewatch it. It's so good. Oh yeah, buckle up <laughs> if you saw the thumbnail. <laughs> this is, um, yep, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> This was the first time I've seen Shrek in years, and I'm gonna be honest, there might be some nostalgia in it for me, but I'm mostly here for the memes. Movie of the week is Shrek. <laughs> the intro credit sequence lets you know what you're in for right away. The fairy tale fake out to the all star to the disgusting day in the life of Shrek. This film wants you to know it will be the antithesis of the fairy tale genre. A big middle finger to the Disney franchise, company, whatever. The intro credit sequence lets you know what you're in for right away. The fairy tale fake out to the to all star to the disgusting day in the life of Shrek. This film wants you to know it will be the antithesis of the fairy tale genre. A big middle finger to the Disney company. Shrek prevails as a classic after over 20 years as it actively rejects this genre, literally and figuratively. And it works well with the humor, like, I miss the 2000s. <laughs> Karens would want this movie canceled if it came out today. The jokes and innuendos wouldn't fly today considering people will get mad at Disney for mentioning periods in one of their movies. <laughs> Dare I compare this to Monty Python? <laughs> Monty Python, I mean, they're considered iconic and classic and revolutionary, but have you seen the meaning of life? The singing bird situation, the mama bear rug, the dragon donkey in love thing? Shrek does share that wacky, absurd, and kind of adult-ish sense of humor. <laughs> Sorry for that controversial statement, but I do compare this to Monty Python in a, in a way. <laughs> Mike Myers as Shrek is such a good choice. Eddie Murphy as Donkey is also iconic. I'm making waffles. Those two are the heart of the story and carry the film's comedy from start to finish. Fiona is also a fun character, sticking with the theme of the film as she is far from a Disney princess as you could get. I think that solidified her from her curse of being an ogre, and honestly, that's pretty clever. I mean, so many girls look at this princess not as a beautiful, charismatic, happy girl with a thin figure, but as a fat, ugly individual who isn't afraid to belch in your face or punch a dude in the face. That's pretty iconic. But Farquaad? <laughs> wow. Best villain in all of animation. There, I said it. But every scene with him is gold. He's ridiculous, and he is a legend. This brings me to my favorite lines and scenes. The introduction to Farquaad was amazing. It was menacing and intense, and it led to the reveal of his height and the amazing interrogation of Gingerbread Man. Do you know the Muffin Man? The Muffin Man? The Muffin Man! Yes, I know the Muffin Man. Who lives on Drury Lane? Well... She's married to the Muffin Man. The Muffin Man? The Muffin Man! That's cinematic history. 
Shrek rescuing Fiona from the castle is genuinely fun. The bridge scene with him and Donkey. Shrek! I'm looking down! Hilarious. But the action was fun, spoof or not. And let's not forget the best line in the entire movie. Ogres are like onions. They stink? Yes. No. Oh, they make you cry? No. Oh, you leave them out in the sun, they get all brown, start sprouting little white hairs. No. Layers. Honestly, this whole movie experience, it may have been several years since I've seen the movie, but I watched it so much as a kid, just like so many in my generation, I still remembered almost every line anyways. Shrek makes me cringe, but I'll admit, it is quite the guilty pleasure. <laughs> now, I figured at the time, I'm here, I have time. So I watched the sequel purely for Prince Charming. I know he's got a bit of a fan base. If I haven't seen the original in several years, then it's definitely been a millennia since I've seen the sequel. I do remember that as a kid, I, I preferred the second, but not the third. But overall, the first was always my favorite anyways. So... Why not see if it still holds up as my second favorite? <laughs> I literally remembered nothing about it. I just knew that Julie Andrews is in it and Prince Charming was the was Gilderoy Lockharting all over the movie. Also, remember when I compared Shrek to Monty Python? Well, hearing the king now, I can clearly recognize him as John Cleese. <laughs> I'm not even gonna look it up. I just know it's it's John Cleese. Cleese and Andrews playing married characters, that's a little iconic. Like, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, watching this movie was an interesting experience just because I totally forgot the entire plot, but the more I watched, the more moments when I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Like, Puss in Boots. I totally forgot about him somehow. <laughs> forgot that this was the one where Shrek was human. <laughs> It's just as cursed as I remember, but I have zero memories of Donkey being a horse. <laughs> Some lines caught me off guard, like the gender-confused wolf line and the police brutality scene. Um, also, the movie references here. There were a lot of references. <laughs> At the end of the day, the sequel doesn't hit the way the first one did, but your local five-year-old will still enjoy it. Shrek, the first movie, will remain as a memeable masterpiece. Now, these stars of the week are a little out there, but I feel like I've been watching a lot of their movies lately and I keep seeing their names, so here we are. The stars of the week are Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio. There's not too much on their background. Sorry, <laughs> Wikipedia is a bit sparse for them, but it seems like these guys have known each other and have worked with each other since the 80s, so that's pretty cool. Now going from here, their filmography is almost identical as the A-Team had quite the start of their career. And boy oh boy did they start it right. Ted and Terry are the godfathers of Disney's Aladdin franchise. The original movie, the sequels, the show, Aladdin was their boy. This was also followed by some amazing opportunities. The Double T's provided stories and screenplays and the likes for movies such as 1999's Godzilla, Disney's Treasure Planet, Road to El, El Dorado, and the Zorro movies. But they totally hit it big time with, you'll never guess, Shrek. Yep, bringing it back. <laughs> Neither were involved with the sequels or specials or anything, but they wrote the original story, created the iconic characters, and are very responsible for this cultural phenomenon. Now get this, it's not the only cultural phenomenon they're responsible for. You're definitely not going to believe this, but Ted and Terry, the creators of Shrek, were also the writers of The Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. They wrote the story, they created the characters, and were involved with every movie except the last one, which saw Ted Elliott absent. But yeah, Shrek and Jack Sparrow have the same dads. <laughs> like, even though Johnny Dub kind of took the character and made it his own, like, the concept of the character, that was Ted and Terry. So yeah, Shrek and Sparrow have the same dads. <laughs> 
that revelation is literally the only reason why these guys are the stars of the week. <laughs> I just really want people to know this. <laughs> Anyways, other than these big projects, there's not much that I'd point out, but they're really the unsung heroes of some iconic film experiences. Hollywood, just pay your writers, fix your financial squabbles, get it together so that all the Teds and Terrys of the world can write the next big thing. Please and thank you. That's it for this week. Again, follow me on Twitter or leave a comment and let me know what you've been fangirling over this week. Thank you for joining me and I'll talk to you again next week.